Well, go ahead and hold up your Bible or your tablet or phone, whatever you get your scripture on, and read this with me, please. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. In this book are the keys to an abundant life, a joy-filled life, and eternal life. I will take God at His Word. Amen. That's always where we begin and end. And uh, you, you know, what, what limits do pastors see people putting on their own faith? Well, some people say, God gets Sunday morning, nothing else. I grew up like that. Some people say, God gets some of my money, but none of my time. Some people say, God gets some of my time, but none of my money. And these limits, oftentimes, I, I, you know, I remember when I was a young Christian, I, I refused to teach Sunday school. And the reason is because I intended... Every single Sunday from early August until the end of September, I intended to be gone every Sunday until I got my sheep and my moose and my caribou. See, I was limiting God. I was saying, no, no, you come after me and, and what I want to do. And it's very easy to do this. Um, you know, we sing that beautiful hymn, I surrender all. But if we were going to be honest, most of us at most times in our, in our Christian life should be singing, I surrender some. And there are some, you, you know, believers who say, I'm not surrendering anything. Okay, the scripture talks about those who enter heaven as those narrowly escaping flames. Right, it's so easy. In fact, even unconsciously, we can get selfish without even recognizing it. And, you know, this is something that we battle with. And, and we have to be very, very careful. And then the other side of the spectrum is those people who, who, who say yes to everything that the church desires from them. Or that every opportunity to serve and feel guilty if they're not doing everything. You know, like they somehow just have to earn their way to God's approval. And, and, if, and if I ever say no, you know, then I'm disappointing God and I'm disappointing people. And, and uh, you know, as though we could, we, you know, as though Guilt is a, is a proper motive, right, for ministry. I'll tell you, that, that, that sense of guilt, that's not the voice of the Lord, right? That, that, that's your enemy coming, coming with that. Well, what's reasonable in life? We all have responsibilities. We all have different things going on in life. What's reasonable? What, what does God expect John chapter 12, starting with verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary, now understand Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, they're uh, siblings. So th there are three siblings living uh, unmarried and living together. All right, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. It's easy to read over that. You have to stop and camp there for a minute. A year's wages. If you work full time at McDonald's, that's over $30,000. For most people, if we're talking about a working man's wage, which is what they're talking about there, we would be talking about 60000 70000 100000 We're talking about a lot of money, and you need to get that. Okay, a lot, a lot of money. Without question, it was Mary's most valuable possession. And as a woman, without a husband, I mean, think about that. This was her livelihood, this was her insurance, her security. This was her savings account. This was her retirement. And she just poured it out for Jesus. She didn't have a family meeting with Martha and Lazarus to talk about it, you know, to decide what she should do. She didn't pour just enough to fill the room with fragrance and to anoint Jesus. You know, she, she didn't put the stopper back in and put 90% back in the bank. Right, she just kept pouring. And, and just like that, 30000 40000 50000 60000 70000 dollars gone just like that. Just like that. 
Now, it seems reckless. Why does it seem reckless? Well, because it was reckless, right? It, 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 and we have been called to a reckless faith that is motivated by a love that knows no limits. That's the faith we're called to. A faith that the world would say, that's reckless. That doesn't make any sense. That's what we've been called to. You, you know, God the Father did not so love the world that he gave us a visit from his son with a good word when we needed it and some encouragement. And, a, and, and you know, he, he didn't pour out a little love and wait to see how we would respond. That's not what he did. Jesus didn't say, well, I'm going to let him... I'm going to let them strike me and mock me. I'll let them arrest me, but that's as far as I go. I, I don't mind sacrificing to give part of my life, but anything more would just not be wise. That would be reckless. The Holy Spirit didn't say, well, I'll speak with them and I'll guide them, but you, you, you know, don't pour me out for them. I mean, don't make me live in, in the body of a, of a sinful man or woman. See, God didn't hold anything back. And having received that kind of extravagant love, Mary, this, this woman of God, she just poured everything out for Jesus. That was the great privilege of her life, was to pour out everything. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said to his disciples in Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Right, it, it, his blood was poor. It wasn't a little blood. You know, after the suffering and the, and the brutality and shedding of his blood that were a part of the whippings and the beating and the spikes being driven in and the piercing right of his side, uh, I mean, he, he poured out everything for you and me and then he was exalted to heaven because God wasn't done pouring out. God the Father had already poured out his love. The, uh, Jesus had already poured out his blood, but there was something more. And in Acts 2.33, exalted to the right hand of God, he, Jesus, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. See, this was the day of Pentecost. Uh, on the night Jesus rose from the dead, he breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. From that moment forward, Christians had received the Holy Spirit. Every Christian, the moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. And it was to those Christians with the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem for the gift my Father promised. You see, there's something more that you need. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but there's something more that you need. You need this pouring of the Holy Spirit. You need, why? Because you need power. Well, that power was poured out. For what purpose? It's so that a recklessly saved church can invade Satan's kingdom on earth and set the captives free. That's why. And that's what our team was doing in Ukraine. And that's what we do here. It's the purpose of the church. Some people say, well, yeah, that was a specific instance and it was just for the first disciples, you, you know, those Jews who had been with Jesus. It's not for us. Listen, God put that to rest because soon after this, the, the Jewish Christians began taking the gospel uh, outside, beyond their own people. And when the Gentiles were radically saved, God, uh, what did God do? He poured out his spirit in the same way on the Gentiles. And at, in fact, the Jewish Christians were shocked. Acts 10, 45, the circumcised believers, that's the Jewish Christians who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles. See, and that kind of pouring out is, uh, of Mary, that's a response to the pouring out that she had received. We are not called to a stingy, miserly faith. We are not called to a conservative, academic faith. We're not called to a divided, partial faith. We're, we're, we're not called to a faith that sets sensible limits. We are called to this radical, reckless faith that says, He gave everything for me, so I'm giving everything to Him. The, the Apostle Paul poured out his life for Christ in just this way. And do you know what he said in Philippians 2.17? But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the, on the sacrifice and service coming from faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. 
Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know, Mary did a beautiful thing for Jesus, and the world would say a year's wages with most of it ending up on the floor, right? That was, that was irresponsible. That was foolish. One of Jesus' followers we heard from, he was like that. Again, back to verse 4. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You know, there are, uh, the, the world has all kinds of uh, uh, better ways that, that Christians could use their, the money that God has given them. You know that? Years ago, I was waiting in line to go through customs at an African airport. There was a Westerner in front of me. I, I struck up a conversation. Turned out he was from uh, America. He was a U.S. diplomat to that country. And when I told him that I was there for ministry, he got this mocking look on his face and literally sneered very condescendingly to me. And he said, he said, uh, couldn't you have spent all that money helping someone closer to home? Aren't there any needs where you live? And I said to him, I said, oh yeah, my wife and I have adopted three children and we've taken in and helped raise about two dozen more. And I minister in our prisons and I've given tens of thousands of dollars to our local ministries, but I'm sure you've done a lot more than that. And he got an immediate stricken look on his face and he apologized and turned away from me. See, the devil and his children hate what you give to Christ. The devil and his children hate what you give to Christ. They'll say you're a fool for giving your resources or your life to missions or to ministry. And, and, and they'll say you're a fool for walking away from a lucrative career to serve Christ. They always know a better way that you could be spending what God has given you. Whether we're talking about your money or your life. That was Judas. See, but Mary, she knew where she'd be without Christ. She knew where her family would be without Christ. She knew what her future would be without Christ. She knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the King of the world, and she knew a love for Christ that had no limits. She knew that she was given everything that she had to Christ no matter what other people thought or said. And you know, sometimes we th see that spirit of responsible Christianity even within the church. I know a man that to his shame counseled a young woman out of ministry and into a career because it paid better and had better benefits. Pitiful. That's not who we are. She was giving a beautiful thing to the Lord. No, it didn't make sense financially. Ministry never does. Never. No, it didn't make sense from the standpoint of retirement. Ministry never does. But I'll tell you where it makes sense. It makes sense to God the Father, to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit, to all the angels in heaven. It makes perfect sense. Because they understand something that the world doesn't understand. And that is that the souls of men and women and children are eternal and they are precious to God. And there's nothing more important than investing all that we have in reaching just one more. That, that's God's economy. That's God's economy. Verse 9, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. You know, isn't it strange that Satan has never learned his lesson? He still thinks if he kills the messengers, he can kill the message. And so he's killing the messengers. He's doing it all over the globe today. He continues. People are martyred at a more uh, a rapid rate than ever before in history for their Christian faith. And the message continues to steamroll through the nations. And people are being saved everywhere on earth. You know, but, but his plans never change. Don't like the message. Kill the messenger. Kill the messenger. That's just what he does. They said, well, Lazarus, people are coming to see him. He got raised from dead. We're going to have to kill him too. You know, the Jewish 
religious leaders, they'd always been the center of attention. And they'd always been at the forefront of religion and culture. And now they were a distant second behind Jesus. They didn't like it. But you see, the love of God was on the move. And there was nothing they could do to stop it. There was nothing that they could do to stop it. Everybody likes to receive praise. Maybe a daydream about the applause of crowds. Maybe you've experienced it a number of times. I remember as an elementary student, in, we, we got to play flag football at the halftime of the varsity games on Friday night under the lights. In a small town, everybody comes to the game. And, and just the roar, you know, as you run in. And, of course, with our little upward kids, you know, they come through the tunnel into the gym. Everybody likes that. And on this particular day that we celebrate today, Jesus is coming to applause. But the strange thing is the people who... Who were, who were applauding, who were, who were celebrating and shouting praises, they didn't even understand the reason for their own praise. They were looking for a, for, for a king that was going to overthrow the Roman government and bring them independence and strength and prominence as a nation. They were getting a king who was going to do something very different, and we see that in 12 through 16. The next day... The great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. And that these things had been done to him, all written centuries before the events. How could Jesus ride into that impending crisis that he knew about, what was coming? How could he ride into that without a shred of worry? Because he trusted his father. And, and that's the reckless faith that, that we see in Mary. She poured out everything because she trusted her father. She trusted. Love, when you trust, you have no fear of giving everything. Whatever the Lord wants, if the Lord needs it, if the Lord desires it, or even if my heart is just moved to give it, God says that's worthy in His sight. It's a blessing in His sight. You know, we'll face many kinds of trials, and the road ahead is sometimes going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. But He wants us to get out of bed in the morning and, and make a triumphal entry into the world. Right? He wants us to get up. He wants us to rejoice in who he is and in who he has made us to be as children of God. Now, if you're not a child of God, that's your starting point because this life is only an introduction to your story. The next chapter, the next chapter for it to be written in heaven, you need by faith to receive the gift that Christ offers. That gift of forgiveness and eternal life. You don't get this because you, 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 you know, carry some certain denominational brand and you say, well, I'm Baptist or I'm Methodist or I'm Catholic. You don't, you, that's not a ticket to heaven. You won't find that in the scripture. You don't get it because of what some person has done for you. Well, I was baptized or I was confirmed or, 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 or whatever. That, that, you won't find that in the scripture. Jesus said, you have to be born again. No one will enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. Well, how does that happen? It happens by faith. When you, believing that Jesus is the crucified and risen Savior of the world, you come by faith and you ask him to forgive you and to save you. You literally lay your life down. You surrender it uh, on the altar that is Jesus. And, and, and the Bible says your old self dies in that moment and a new person is born, a person who lives forever. And if you've never come by faith and asked him to forgive you and save you, we want to give you that opportunity right here, right now. And we'll all pray along with you. We'll all just bow, bow your heads and just pray this simple prayer of faith. Jesus, I do believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And I believe you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I've said and thought and done so many things that are wrong. I know I'm guilty. 
I'm asking you, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm asking you to save me, to adopt me, to be a child of God. Here and now, I'm giving my life to you. And by faith, because you promised, I want to thank you for forgiving me, and I want to thank you for saving me. My life now belongs to you.